I've always wanted to explore fixed wing drones. When the war in Ukraine started, I saw the proliferation of FPV drones along with other UAVs, but I knew that fixed wing platforms have more endurance and efficiency, making them more ideal for larger payloads and longer range. Thus, my interest grew. I flew a Ranger 2400 for a research project, but at the time, I didn't know much about drones. I just run, run, run. <laughs> now, I've reapproached the problem with renewed focus and knowledge from taking my AP Physics classes. I researched by going on YouTube and looking at how people made their own drones. While many people opted for a pre-built airframe, there were also plenty of people in the community who built their own airframes. This intrigued me the most, because building your own airframe allows you to be very creative and gives you flexibility in your design. I saw Experimental Airlines' video, and their method of construction was very straightforward. After watching the NoobTube video, I decided to build my own. To build a similar aircraft, you first have to build the airframe and then after that work on the electronics. Before building, I flew a Volantec 600 I had laying around for some time, until it got blown away by the wind, unfortunately. FPV interested me, as it always has, so I had an FPV camera on it. Though FPV isn't necessary, it can be helpful and fun. I highly recommend flying a smaller, cheaper, and easier to fly aircraft before building your own, as it allows you to tune your skills. The flight of a drone does not just depend on how well it was built, but also the skill of the operator. Thus, if you want a drone that flies well, you also need an experienced pilot. Now, as I moved towards the first stage of the project, which was building the airframe, I needed to decide on my dimensions. I ultimately opted for a 46 inch wingspan along with a 30 inch fuselage. I made the horizontal and vertical stabilizers with whatever foam board scraps I had left, but they came out to have 52 square inches and 24 square inches of surface area respectively. The wings have a 6 inch cord and a 2 centimeter tall dual purpose wing spar and former for the arm and wing, which is two layers of foam board thick. The wings are held together by wing spars made of popsicle sticks that are inserted into slots in the wing. After making the airframe, I needed to work on my electronics. I originally used a cheap power pack from AliExpress for my propulsion, elevator, and rudder, but after reading about how such cheap components aren't worth buying, I got more reliable Metal Gear servos for my ailerons. The reason why it's worth shelling out a few more dollars in this scenario is that you pay for more reliable components to protect the rest of your plane. For instance, since your $6 servo is less likely to fail than your $2 servo, it's less likely that you'll lose your $150 aircraft. I made control rods using some metal wire that I found in my garage. I found that a good way to straighten wire is to clamp one end of the wire and spin the other end with a drill. You can use pliers to make bends as necessary. I found on YouTube that using a 90 degree bend along with heat shrink tubing and another wire can create an easy to use locking mechanism that allows you to hook and unhook the wire from control horns as needed. My control horns were made of pieces of credit card bent at right angles. For my receiver, I bought a Radiomaster RP3. It seemed like it was very capable for the price and it would allow me to fly longer range if I wanted to. Later on though, the antenna connector on it was damaged during one of my flights. So if you decide to purchase one, make sure that the antenna will not be ripped out or damaged in a crash. These use ELRS, which is a radio protocol that is very capable and has good user support and documentation. I use the SpeedyB F405 as my flight controller. A flight controller isn't strictly needed, but it helps a lot and gives you the flexibility to expand it into autonomous flight by adding a GPS module, or into FPV by adding camera and a VTX. There are many other interesting and fun things that you can do with a flight controller, but once again, they aren't strictly necessary for getting into the air. You could just use a PWM receiver if you wanted to. PWM receivers even exist for ELRS. I would highly advise checking for shorts before plugging anything in. I don't have a multimeter because I'm just so cheap that I didn't want to buy one, but if you do want to buy one, it would probably save you from damaging expensive components, so I think it'd be really useful and a good purchase. After testing old electronics, I was almost ready for flight. I did some test throws with my friends to see if the aircraft was stable. Preferably, when thrown, the aircraft would glide smoothly in a straight line. The throw test showed me that the plane was a bit nose heavy, but that was alright with me. 
it was still controllable, whereas a tail-heavy plane would run into much more serious problems. We flew the plane, and though our first flight didn't end well, the second one was smooth. We did not bring spare props though, and the props snapped on landing, which prevented us from having another flight. After that, I made three other trips to the field to take flight. All of them were unsuccessful. From these failures though, I learned to have a stable and strong motor mount, check polarity as my rudder output was reversed, and check orientation of the flight controller, as on one flight my flight controller was reversed and I did not notice, which led to a plethora of problems with stabilization. After so many problems, I decided that I couldn't do this alone. I still had the contact of a man who helped me two years ago with my Ranger 2400. I texted him to meet up with him, and when we did, he helped me quite a bit. He pointed out many problems with my drone, and we were able to fix them on the field. One of the biggest ones is that although the polarity of the ailerons was fine through direct control, the flight controller's stabilization had them reversed. This was fixed quickly on iNav. Though initially I asked him if he could fly the drone for me because my piloting had failed me so far, something compelled me to fly myself. I don't regret the decision as I actually flew pretty well, and I came home feeling elated after the flight. I noticed that the aircraft had a tendency to turn to the left, and this problem can be fixed through trim. In the future, I hope to implement GPS and FPV on this aircraft. With the fusion of FPV and GPS, I will have an effective long-range homemade UAV, as this will provide sensor fusion. There will be both the visual sensor of the camera, which is fed to the pilot that can step in when needed, and also the GPS sensor that allows the drone to fly itself as needed. Here are some small lessons about this specific design that I learned while making the drone. Be sure not to place the rubber band holding chopsticks or carbon fiber rods horizontally with no support above them. That meaning, they should be well behind where the hatch is, otherwise they will move upwards and out of the foam in a crash. If a full layer of foam is above them though, the force will be distributed over a larger area and it will be a more stable attachment point. If you decide to place them lengthwise instead of horizontally though, you will not run into this problem. Because you can make everything as a separate component and then eventually assemble them, for instance, the tail being a separate section that is eventually glued on, in a crash, you don't need to completely rebuild the whole drone. You can just replace the sections of the fuselage that are broken. Be very sure to check polarity and connections before flight. If you aren't very experienced, you can ask someone who is experienced, or look at videos on YouTube or even ChatGPT. Failures are good. They allow us to learn where a design has flaws and how it can be improved. Though a failure can mean what seems like the destruction of hard work, they're really just an opportunity for us to further improve what we have learned. Failures are a gift, not a curse. Charging lipos is a very tricky thing. I've had trouble with power input for my Hota T6. It's important to have a good USB-C PD power source if you choose to use USB-C PD. Also, be sure to treat the charger with care. Don't unplug it while charging is still happening as this can potentially damage it. Make sure the charger doesn't overheat as well, so don't block the fan. I've attached a link to a spreadsheet with all of the materials purchased in the description, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I have some contact info in the description as well. So, thanks for watching. If you'd like to support further projects and videos, I also have a Patreon. There's tons of really cool stuff I really want to get into, you know, I want to get into GPS drones, autonomous missions. There is so much fun stuff ahead and I would appreciate any support. So thank you so much.